to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Revelation. In this series of lessons, we've been identifying some keys and some helps that will encourage us as we study this unique book. Unlike most of the other books in the Bible and the New Testament, Revelation is unique. And we identified in our first two lessons some keys that will help us with that. And in our next two lessons, we're going to be thinking about some of the main lessons in each chapter of the book of Revelation to kind of give an overview of what this book is about. And so I hope you've got your New Testament handy. If you don't have it handy, I want to encourage you to locate your Bible, have it open to the book of Revelation as we're going to study this great book together. Friend, I want you to know today, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study together. We want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. Today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more, about God's church or the plan of salvation or how Christians worship, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you at the Gospel of Christ in your journey to know God's Word better. Won't you visit our website? thegospelofchrist.com. From there, we've got a wide variety of good Bible study materials. We've got lessons on every book of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, along with a wide variety of topics on a variety of different subjects, and we want to encourage you to check those out. You can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and from that, you can access all our videos and audio lessons and transcripts online, or if you need a copy of that, you can fill out a media request and receive a digital download on your device almost instantly, or if you need it for a DVD or a CD, we'd be glad to put that in the mail to you as well. And friend, in our fast-paced world today, or so many people use smartphones, we want to encourage you to check out the app, the Gospel of Christ app in the respective play stores. There you can download that, and it's a great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world today. Let's turn our attention to overviewing the book of Revelation. With the keys that we set in mind in our last couple of lessons, we want to go chapter by chapter and identify some messages that apply to first century Christians, but also messages that resonate with Christians today. In Revelation chapter 1, we want to identify two things that no doubt were an encouragement to Christians then and to us as well. Number one, Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6 identifies the power of Jesus' blood in that He has washed Christians from their sins in his blood. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Why be faithful to Jesus? Look at what he's done to us. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, watch this, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Why should these Christians who are suffering remain true to Jesus? Why today, when we face temptation and suffering and sickness and a whole litany of problems, why should we be faithful to Jesus? This same Jesus has also loved us and washed every one of us from our sins in His own blood. Acts 20 verse 28, Jesus purchased the church 
with his own blood. Acts 22, verse 16, Saul of Tarsus was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And Romans 6, verses 3 through 4, teaches us that we actually contact the blood of Jesus, His death, when we are baptized into it in water. And so when I obey the gospel, when I believe in Jesus, John 8, 24, turn from my sins, Luke 13, 3, confess His beautiful name before men, and when I am immersed, baptized in water for the forgiveness of my sins, I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. John 3, verse 5, we are born again of water and the Spirit. And thus Christians were told, in the first century, in Acts 2, verse 38, to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. You see, it's the blood of Jesus that saves us, right? Matthew 26, 28, Jesus, as He instituted the Lord's Supper, said, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And yet, at the point of obedience to the gospel, culminating in baptism, our sins are washed away. Why remain faithful? Why not give up in the midst of persecution? Why not throw in the towel when things get rough? Jesus has loved every one of us, and He's washed me, and He's washed you from every sin in His own blood. And friend, chapter 1 teaches us another very powerful truth. This same Jesus who washed us from our sins in His own blood. He is alive and He has defeated death so that we don't have to live in fear. Open to Revelation chapter 1 and I want you to know what, notice what the Bible says in verses 17 and 18. There is this great image of Jesus presented and, and John falls down before Him. Verse 17, When I saw Him, this magnificent image, I fell at His feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. What is it that motivates Christians to, to never, ever give up? Jesus, the one who died for you on the cross, the one whom they nailed to that tree and who said, It is finished and gave up the ghost. He didn't remain in the grave. They went to that tomb. They looked in in Mark 16, Luke 24, John 19 through 21, Matthew 27. They looked in. They peered into that tomb. He is not here. He is risen. And because of that, Jesus has defeated death, and I don't have to live in fear. He, through death, overcame him who had the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage in fear. I'm, I don't have to live in fear of sin and death and Satan and, and what any evil government might do to me. I can trust God and I can trust Jesus Christ and if I remain true to Him, Jesus says to me, be faithful unto death. I'll give you the crown of life. All right, let's direct our attention then to chapters 2 and 3. Chapters 2 and 3, the living messages that we see are this is when Jesus directly addresses every one of the seven congregations in Asia Minor. Five of those congregations had things they needed to correct. Only two were commended without correction. And from those congregations, we can learn some very practical truths for the Lord's church, for His congregations today. In Ephesus, we learn this. Ephesus is uh, spoken to first in Revelation chapter 2. In Ephesus, the problem there is they seem to have lost their first love for the Lord's work and worship. Look in, in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4. God says this, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You know, when two people get married, the love that they have, the strength of it, the connection, it's just so strong. At one point, Ephesus, that church there, loved the Lord like that. But they kept growing further and further away from Him to the point that they'd lost their first love for the evangelistic, for the uh, worship, for service to God. They were just kind of maybe going through the motion, stuck in a rut, as it were. 
And Jesus encourages them to repent, else I'll come to you quickly. Chapter 2, verse 10, we're now introduced to the church in Smyrna. And Smyrna is unique in that they're a, a good example of endurance not giving up in the midst of suffering. Look at Revelation 2, verse number 10. To the church in Smyrna, Christ says, these words. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You'll have tribulation ten days. Here it is. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. There were, there were, they, these were serious times. People were being put in prison. And, and the phrase, be faithful unto death, is not as though death might be coming. They were put in prison. Death was very likely imminent for some of them. And Christ says to them, you be faithful in the midst of, in the face of death, and I'll give you the crown of life. What a great example some in the church in Smyrna were for their endurance in the face of suffering. The church of Pergamos, as it is known in chapter 2, is often thought of as the church that tolerated sin. What a bad example of a congregation that allowed sin to go on. Look in chapter 2, verse number 14. To the church in Pergamos, Jesus says these words, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. In the Lord's church there, some, instead of fleeing sin, some, instead of shunning evil, were actually tolerating it. They, not everyone in the church may have been involved in that, but they were tolerating it. They were allowing it to go on. They weren't addressing the sin problem and withdrawing from those who were involved in it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And then we have the church in Thyatira. Thyatira is known as what we might think of as the, the Jezebel church. They have this woman there identified by the picturesque image of the Old Testament Jezebel, and she is wreaking great havoc on this church with her doctrine, with her sexual morality, with how she's influencing others. And Jesus addresses this church, and He says, you're going to have to repent, or else I'm going to come to you quickly, and I'm going to address these issues. And so another congregation where sin, unrighteousness, and ungodliness was being tolerated, and Jesus was not at all. Happy with that. Then in chapter 3, verse 1, I want you to notice the church in Sardis. Sardis had a church as a reputation for being the dead church, being alive, but they were actually a dead church. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Had you asked somebody, they would have known about the church in Sardis. Maybe they would have spoke good things about it. They had a name like they were alive, but really they were dead. Some of that may have been because of apathy. Some of it may have been because of some of the doctrines. Maybe people weren't motivated like they should have. Whatever the case, Sardis was a dead church that needed to come back alive for the Lord. I wonder how many churches like that there are today. They may meet every Sunday. They may have things going on. But really, they're just spinning their wheels and not really doing anything. We don't want to be thought of as dead. We want to be active and alive and doing the work of God. Then the church in Philadelphia, it's commended by the Lord, one of the two congregations that is only commended. And Jesus commended this congregation for two reasons. Number one, chapter 3, verse 8, they accepted a door of opportunity. The door had been opened and they utilized it. That door of opportunity, maybe a door for evangelism, benevolence, to promote the kingdom of God. God opened the door. They went through it. They seized the opportunities God put before them. And then in chapter, eight, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and verse 10, they're commended for keeping God's Word. They held true to the Bible, and they were looking for opportunities to utilize their talents to the glory of God. And then that ever-memorable congregation, the church in Laodicea, this is the church that made Jesus sick to His stomach. 
Look in chapter 3, verse number 14, at what the Lord here says. Beginning in verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Friend, as I think about the church in Laodicea, these were people who were just apathetic. These were people who were not on fire for the Lord. They were stuck in a rut. They were going through the motions. Jesus said, hot's useful, cold's useful, but have you ever laid your coffee cup aside for a little while, maybe a little too long, and you thought, boy, I'd really like another drink of coffee. It's half full. I'd really like another drink of that. You take that cup and put it to your mouth, and you take a swallow. Oh, it's, it's lukewarm, and that is one of the worst things ever. Nobody likes to drink something lukewarm. It makes you want to throw up. Jesus said, because of your apathy, because of your lukewarm mentality, you make me want to throw up. You make the Lord sick to his stomach. And so lukewarm Christians is not what God is looking for in his church. And so let's kind of build the stage here where we're going in Revelation. Chapter 1, Jesus is introduced in great power and majesty and prestige. Chapters 2 and 3, he addresses, uh, Christians need to know it's not, the Caesar on the throne, they need to be concerned about. Jesus is in control of his churches, and we need to hear what he says, and he addresses those still. Now in chapter 4, we learn that God is still enthroned, and he is the one, not Rome and not Caesar, God is the one who's worthy of our adoration and praise. Look in chapter 4 and notice what the Bible says in verse number 11. You've got this great throne room scene. And these people, they fall down before Christ who is on the throne, God who is on the throne. And here's what they say in chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your word they exist and were created. And so Christ is the one. God is the one. Not Listen. It doesn't matter who makes these images, in essence, uh, Jesus says. It doesn't matter who's trying to force you to worship someone else. God's your creator. God is the one that through whom all things exist and were made by, and He, He is the one who is worthy to be praised. Nobody else can attain that honor. Nobody else has that right. God is our maker. We're his sheep, the people of his hand, the sheep of his pasture, the people of his hand. Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6. And thus we ought to praise and honor and worship and give ourselves to God, not others or not governments or not anything else. Christ and God is the one who is worthy of our praise. Now, Revelation 5 then draws a rather unique picture. We see the, uh, th this image of the Lamb, and, and, and the Lamb has a, a scroll, and that scroll represents the unfolding of the vengeance and the wrath of God on the evildoers of that day and age, Rome and her governments. But there's a problem. Nobody can open the scroll. And yet we see this in Revelation 5, verse 5. Revelation 5, verse 5 says, but one of the elders said to me, said to John, do not weep. John became very upset about it. Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scrolls and to loose its seals. This is that, that same lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. John saw him approaching in John 1, and he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Picturesque of that, that scapegoat, that lamb in Exodus 12, the scapegoat in the book of Leviticus, that the, the, the people's sins we put on, it'd be sent out to the wilderness. It would take their sins in its own body, as it were. Jesus is that lamb who has prevailed. Listen to this language. The lamb who has prevailed. Prevailed over what? Satan prevailed over evil governments, prevailed over sin. If he's done all that, he's able to take that scroll. And friend, again, the scroll would represent the unleashing of vengeance, the unrolling of God's wrath 
on those who are doing wrong to Christians. The Lamb arises. He opens that scroll. God's vengeance is meted out on those who have been disobedient to Him. Then chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, we have what I believe to be the key question answered in the book of Revelation. Look in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. When He opened the fifth seal, when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the Word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now here's the question. And they cried out, they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Now watch this. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them they should rest for a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. You, hear the, you see this graphic image. You know, an altar is where sacrifice under the Old Testament, it's where sacrifice to God was made. And there were a lot of animal sacrifices made on those altars. But this is a unique altar. People have made a sacrifice to God. And you have this vivid image of an altar. And under that altar are the souls of those who have died for the cause of Christ. And those souls have an abiding question. How long? God, how long? Are you going to let this go on? How long until you avenge our blood on those who have done this? And the answer is, they're pulled up from that altar. They're enclosed with white robes, representative of the holiness, the majesty, the purity of God. And they're told, just wait a little while longer. God's going to right all wrongs. There are others who must suffer also. But God is still in control. He's going to right all wrongs, and you've been given that elevated place in the kingdom of God. Friend, what a powerful lesson. No matter what happens today, no matter what we face, God's still in control. Chapter 7, verse 10, we then learn that salvation belongs to our God. Look in chapter 7, verse 10. You've got this graphic image of the 144,000, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, chapter 7, verse 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I don't need to look to other sources for salvation. People can't save me. Ide men's ideologies can't save it. World leaders, world governments, that's not where our strength is. Salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. Chapter 8, verse 3, we see the power of prayer in suffering. Look at what is said in chapter 8, verse 3. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Think, think about that image. There's this altar and incense is being offered. And, and incense naturally when it's burned it rises up. What is this that's rising up to the throne of God? The prayers of the saints. God knows their suffering. God cares. God knows what they're dealing with and that their, their plight and their problem is not being ignored by God. God in His own time and His own way is going to deal with that. Well, what about all these people who are causing these, these bad things to happen to Christians? They don't have the right attitude. The Bible says God pleads with them and they don't do the right thing. Look in Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. The Bible says that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither be seen nor heard nor walked. Now listen to this. And they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immoralities, or their thefts. Friend, that's what God, does God want to destroy people? Of course not. God wants Rome. He wants the Caesar. He wants everybody to be saved. God appeals to them. God reminds them they did not repent of those things. What an emphatic statement of finality. They did not repent. They had an opportunity. They made it right. They could have made it right. They didn't change their ways. Friend, doesn't that remind us that while we have opportunity and time, we need to make sure we're right with God? 
Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 and 11 then, we have John who receives this bittersweet message. Look at chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. John says, So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. This angel has the little book. He said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I'd eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. We think of this as a, a bittersweet message. The message is sweet in the sense that God's power is still in control. God is going to deal with the nations, but there's going to be problems. People are going to do things along the way. God doesn't want them to. There are going to be people who rebel against God. There are going to be people who persecute Christians. There are going to be those who are involved in and, and, and want more immorality in our world today. And while that may occur, Christians need to be reminded the ultimate message of the gospel is sweet in the sense that if we stay true to God, we can have the hope of heaven. Now that final message, Revelation chapter 11, verse number 15, we hear that God's kingdom is going to be the ultimate kingdom that outlasts all other kingdoms. Look in chapter 11, verse number 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. What about Rome? What about, what about Babylon? What about Assyria? What about the Medes and the Persians? What about Rome? All of those kingdoms at one point or another were oppressors, of God's people. Currently, Rome is. What's going to happen to the Roman kingdom? The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign over them. Friend, the message is this. Christ, Christ church, and Christians are going to be victorious. And so we're glad you joined us today for our study of the book of Revelation. Join us next time as we will continue our overview with the last chapters in the book of Revelation. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.